lot of people don't understand, how can Leon Russell have a piano player? There's a thing between a, a minor and a major in the black church that I added to his element. I would sneak that minor in there, but it would give attention. Woo! People wouldn't know what was hitting them. Leon loved it. When he first heard me playing, he said, oh, okay. You know, that's why he said, he's going with me. <laughs> Leon had just finished the, you know, Mad Dogs and the Englishman thing. I kind of already read a lot about Cocker and wasn't too excited. And sure enough, he came to the audition and laid on the floor and slept through the whole audition, Cocker did. Two weeks later, they said, we'll bring in someone else because Cocker passed on us. And they brought in Leon. It was funny, I had never heard of him. And I'm sitting in my apartment one day after I found out we were gonna audition for him. This shot came on the air and it was the intro to a song for you. And it's just like it sauntered in, I wrote, like a soft mist of rain. And Donny Hathaway's voice, oh, I've been so many places in my life and time. I went, whoa, what song is this? I'd never heard the song. He said, now here's the man who wrote the song. And I set up, I went, oh, this is who I'm auditioning for. And I realized then, man, I was in some good trouble. <laughs> they didn't think I played well enough to play for the girls for the audition. And White says, well, I'm going to play for the girl. So he only learned three songs. And when they got through with those three songs, Leon went, uh, I don't, I, I don't think this is it. And he asked me, he said, do y'all know any more songs? And they said, Patrick knows all of our songs. And he said, oh, yeah, well, let me hear. So I sat down to the piano, and I started the intro to Sweeping Through the City. And Leon sat up, right? Dun, 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 dun. And the wheel goes through. From that, I think I played uh, One Day in Paradise. And Leon stood, he said, this is what I'm looking for. And he turned to the guy and said, is he included in the package? They said, yeah, we thought he'd be the roadie. He said, Leon said, like, hell, he's going to be playing the Steinway next to me. He said, can you, looked over at me and said, can you leave tomorrow? And the rest was history. I had no idea. Nothing but God. My life changed forever. Leon picked me up at the airport in the Rolls Royce with a houndstooth check top. He said, yeah, get in the front seat. You hungry? I said, I'm sorry. He said, hey, you like barbecue? I said, I love barbecue. He buys me two He don't know nothing about barbecue. And he laughed. He says, we'll see about that. And then from that point on, we were just famous friends. We laughed. We talked. We were somewhere in a mall or something, and he saw this coat by Pierre Carter, and you know, I'm a clothes horse. He saw me try on the coat, and I loved it. He had them to go and buy the coat, and for my birthday, he gave me the coat. Uh, <laughs> I never had a love like that. Nobody just loved me, you know, and not tell me, you know what I mean, just to do things, just to show, man, I love you to life. You know, I think about so many things he did, you know, so many things I would do for him just to, Try to give back the love. I see. I see. see, I never understood why Leon called me Reverend. Because I didn't like being called Reverend. Because I was fearing somebody was going to see me smoking a cigarette or having a glass of wine. I thought you was a Reverend, and here you are drinking liquor. Nah, I didn't want that mess. I hated the hypocrisy. I wanted to be real. I didn't want to live a double life, you know. But now I understand because God, my ministry, is just something that I didn't claim. It was something that God gave me to do, and I'm living it. There are two kinds of preachers. There's the evangelists, Thomas Jefferson called them, traveling evangelists, who come into town, sleep with all the women, talk about all the sinners, and then they leave town. They don't care about the people. And then there's the shepherd. Leon was a shepherd. He gathered his flock and he provided places for them to abide and to dwell. A church, how appropriate. Nobody went hungry. You know, I had a little period there where it was a little rough, you know, and stuff. I didn't have to worry about where I was going to sleep. There was this caring, there was this nurturing, there was, there was this endless possibility of being cared for like a good shepherd. Leon was a great shepherd.
And I think he just set a, what is it, a paradigm that people wanted to be around. It's like when Jesus came, they, the masses followed them. He didn't lure them, but they saw his miracles. They saw the changes he made, praying and healing people and stuff. So people wanted to just be around that. They wanted to be in the uh, elan of it, in the space, in the, the atmosphere. People come to me and they talk about it. Oh, I never forget the time I just laid my hand on, or I got a hair from his, on his shirt. I mean, it's just, well, they can say it's fanatical. You know, people can say whatever they want to say about it, but I love it. See, I always saw him as an Assemblies of God preacher. He laughed when I said it, but he had all the, the motions. He said, this ain't Assemblies of God, this is Church of God in Christ, and he was right. The Assemblies of God came out, the Churches of God in Christ. A lot of people don't know that. It was against the law for them to worship together because of the color lines. But it all started at Azusa in California. They all started worshiping together. And Leon knew that. He went to the root of it. So anytime there was a Church of God in Christ, something going on anytime in the city we were in, and I'd tell him about it, uh, tell the driver, let's go. I would take him and he would just love the singing. He would, he was his man, that's just it. And another life, I always told him, you know, see, he was a Kojic preacher and he'd just laugh, you know, he loved that, you know. But he wasn't religious. He wasn't religious, that's what I loved about him, you know. He, he called it an artificially induced religious experience. I said, but ain't nothing artificial about this. This is the real deal right here. You know, like when we were in Japan and he would have the people to take off something that they loved that was dear to them, you know, like a ring or a necklace or something, and give it to somebody they didn't know, a complete stranger. That to him was love. That to him was, and they would throw things up on the stage. Sometimes they throw panties, <laughs> but they would throw J rings, you know, beautiful necklaces and stuff, and as a, as an offering to us. But they wanted to give back, you know, and he he ordained it and he sustained it. You know, he didn't do it everywhere. It was just some places, I think, because he could feel the mood of of the spirit in the place. So he might just say so and so, so and so, and he started the intro. We know what the intro was. He didn't tell us he was going to change it. He just started the intro, and everybody knew it, you know. And we just follow him. And I, and I do that to this day. I'll tell the choir we're going to sing so and so, so and so, and the minister will say something, or I'll feel a move of the spirit, and I'll pick another song because I know that song needs to be right here. He was that way. It was an instinct. I hadn't seen him in years. And I'm gonna give her the credit for this. Melissa Scarborough found me. I was living in Baltimore. And she said, we want to bring you to Louisville to see Leon. We know you haven't seen him in a long time and we wanna know if you'd be interested in coming. And I said, oh yes, I'd love to see him. This has been years. I went and he looked at me, he said, Man, there's sure some pretty teeth you got there. Where you get them teeth from? And we just fell out of laughing. Because, you know, we were older men then, you know. We were trying to keep ourselves collected, you know, and, and in one piece. We laughed and we talked. And he said, he said, you know, you're not a disappointment to me. He said, you're still a person of integrity. He said, you're still an honest man. He said, you never did nothing to, to rile me or to make me believe that you ever changed, Patrick. He said, no, I want you to know I love you and I honor you for the man you've become. And from that point on, you know, I went to his house down in Nashville and started hanging out with him and uh, cooking for him. You know, then I cooked for his mommy who was sick at the time. And they see that food saved her, Patrick, and let him left to live a few more months, but he just treated me like royalty. He really did. He, he treated me as a special son. He loved me unconditionally, so it was easy to give back, you know. He was, he was a special man, really. Mm -hmm.